to uh, end this last conference, uh, I, I want to introduce um, some of you who've already met, but it, 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 it's, it's particular to why we're here today. Uh, after the event uh, in Sabote, Hungary, we were um, going to come reconvene for the next year, and we had made deep friends with those people. We have Rudy here and Nathan, and you know, it's just how it is with people who come together under these circumstances and you have a, a common purpose and you find it out and, and you join together. But And so we were looking forward to seeing Philip. And Philip writes us out of the blue and he said, I can't make it. I can't make it. And we were disappointed. He said, but don't worry. He said, I'm going to put on an event in Australia. And Martha and I went, oh, no. <laughs> we have to go to Australia. <laughs> we never been here. And we came. And we fell in love with Sydney. We really enjoyed the conference in Canberra. And it opened up a whole new world. And Philip's event turned into the founding, ultimately, of the Gold Standard Institute, which is now, this is his inaugural event. And it's due to his efforts and the efforts of Marcus, who helped him at the first one, to leave it here. And, and my sense is, in leaving this last event, that this is not the last time we're going to be back in Australia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Um, okay, so we're into the final straight, the last session on the last day mm -hmm. of the seminar. It's a little sad, but... I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as we have, uh, myself and the speakers, because what you've experienced is unique in the world. There is nowhere else in the world where you can experience a discussion on monetary matters in such depth and in such detail. It really is quite unique, and I hope that all of you will come back to Canberra next year, because yes, there will be a third session in Canberra, a third seminar in Canberra, Possibly also in some other capital cities as well. We certainly intend to have more than just one seminar next year in Australia. And with Louise's help, maybe another one in New Zealand. So, <clears throat> yeah, that would be really great. Because uh, while, we're, while the professor's over here and all the speakers come an awful long way to be here, do understand these speakers find from all over the world. And at this stage, they don't even get reimbursed for their expenses. They come for their sheer enthusiasm for the subject and to help to disseminate this vital information. So I want to thank you as the audience because you've been a really terrific audience and I do mean that. And I want you to understand that you are an elite. I suspect you probably do, but I mean, not like a Wall Street elite, not like a Wall Street elite, a real elite. I really mean that in the proper sense of the word. And that's a credit to you. And one of the regrets I have at, all, at the end of all these seminars is that, um, you know, even though they're spread over four days, I find that uh, I have a real trouble getting around and talking to all the people I want to get to talk to. There's so many interesting people in the audience. And in fact, you know, there are two aspects to the seminar for me. And I think it applies to most people that I've spoken to as well. There is the aspect of the seminar where we're listening to the speakers and gaining all that invaluable knowledge. And then there is the other aspect of the seminar where you're not in listening to the speakers and we're out there spread around talking to each other. And it's just as exciting. I regard, I mentioned it to Rudy this morning, as the co-seminar. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's, it's just almost, it's like a debriefing where you get out there and you chat, did you get that bit and you have a chat about this? And, and you meet these fantastic people, and I'm talking about you, and it's really great. So, I want to thank some people who, uh, you know those behind the scenes people, but it is really important because young Judith over here, the good professor's wife at the start, you know, I don't think any of this would have ever happened, any of the seminars at all. I suspect there's some truth, truth to that. Judith sits there and she's a tour de force. This would never have happened anywhere if it hadn't been for Judith and pushing the professor along and getting it started and running the first seminar and organising it and making, sending emails to people like me to get me to come along. And it's a wonderful thing and it's a great thing. Martha Shoon over here, who stands behind that camera day after day at every single seminar, shooting the film, and uh, often I'm sure she needs a pee, but she stands there. 
But after that, she goes away and does hundreds of hours of editing, all for the love of it. There's, there's nothing else that comes to her. But thank you, Martha. You're, you're all good. point out it has been mentioned but she does but Martha does run the website as well and um, Rudy also who does really comes to these seminars again under his own steam no expenses paid and uh, he comes out here and he runs the camera all day long and he answers questions from people where something needs a clarification and he comes up here and speaks and it's just non-stop for four days and uh, Young Rudy is also the editor-in-chief of the Gold Standard Institute, and there is a lot of work involved in that. This is one busy man and one very valuable man that you have standing up here. Thank you. And Jack Ludwig, I want to mention, back here, who's been working behind the scenes on the Fekete Library, the wonderful collection that Professor Fekete donated to the Institute, which on its own constitutes probably the finest library of its kind in the world. And um, Jack is working with a friend of his on some software so that we can get that properly organized when we get to Vienna and have a properly catalog so the books will be in an order. And all these things are happening behind the scenes. Thank you very much for Jack. And Bron has done massive amounts of emails backwards and forwards by the ton about the medallion. And uh, you know, all these things are happening behind the scenes, and these people get no validation for it whatsoever. So I'd like to validate you for it, Ron. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Sandeep, Mr. Sandeep Jaitley, my young London friend here, who's uh, Sandeep and I have been working, and this is very much a Sandeep initiative on the establishment of an annuity for the Gold Standard Institute. A lot of work has gone into it, particularly on Sandeep's side. I'm the recipient of the work, and um, it's a fantastic thing, and it gives, it gives impetus for the future, and it gives, it gives future to what we're doing to have people working towards these things going forward. So thank you, Sandeep. And um, Marcus, of course, we've well, already got lots of claps, Marcus, but you've done a great job at this seminar anyway. So thank you. And uh, lastly, I'd like to speak about a guy who wandered up to me two days ago and uh, asked me some fairly pointed questions about the Institute. It was quite interesting. Asked me some searching questions. Pointed sounds a bit rough, but searching questions. And I answered, and he asked some more, and I answered. And, um, and then he said, So, when are you going to do this? And I said, Well, I'll be there in April. He said, Oh, well, I'll move across there and help you if you like. And I'd like you to stand up, Mitchell. Mitchell Eubank will be moving across the room. And I'm going to to a gold standard, which was very extensively worked out by Nathan Narusis. He spent an awful lot of time on this. And I think it's a fine document, actually, a collection of documents. So yeah, I, actually, I should mention that. You're quite right. Thank you, Marcus. It'd be a bit more obvious doing that. <laughs> working on the Institute, the Institute is progressing. I sometimes get the sense with um, when I'm talking to people that there's a little bit of an unreality about actually what is going to happen and, and um, I'll expand upon that in a moment. I'm also going to thank the speakers but there are so many of them this year and they've all been thanked and everyone knows how wonderful they are because you've all listened to them so I probably won't slow this down too much because we want to hear Professor Pequete. But all the speakers have done a fantastic job. I've been not only informed and educated, but entertained 
and um, you've done a wonderful job and without you of course there is no seminar and it's just been wonderful and I've learned so much again and even when I hear something that I've actually heard before or read before in a, heard before in a lecture or read before in one of the articles it always imprints itself even better onto my mind and I get a clearer understanding and I just love it. So the speakers, all of them, thank you so much. So I am going to talk a little bit about the Institute now and um, about what we're doing. Um, possibly some of you already know this, but uh, if I'm going over old ground, so be it. We will be, my, my wife, family, uh, my wife, children and I are moving over there in April. Mitchell will be moving over there at the same time. We have some settling in to do, um, but we should be up and running with the Institute open by June. I, I actually found a premise over there which was affordable and which was just about doable, but um, I thought it not right to sign a lease on a place that I actually hadn't seen. It looked fantastic and I checked it out from the air and all those things, but in the end I backed off from it. I, thought I just did not have the time to fly over at the moment. It came up two weeks ago and I was already by then working on the seminar. And, so we actually don't have a site, that's the short end of the story. But, so we're going to go over there, we're going to get ourselves a residence, we'll take a temporary residence until we work out where the Institute is actually going to be sited within Vienna itself, and then we'll get ourselves a residence somewhere close. And um, the residence, the, the Institute presentation is incredibly important. I can't end up on the second floor of some Baptist Street office block. This, this has to be, you know, presentation in life is important, how we look and how buildings look, how businesses look. It actually makes a statement to people outside, particularly to the media. And I hope to get the media into here. It's a little glass of water, excuse me. I have some, I have a, one really great media contact and uh, we're fairly assured of television coverage when we open and some pretty spiffing media turnouts, but we need to be looking good when they come in. So it's important that the Institute looks good. And um, the overarching thing that I want you to understand with this is that, you know, somebody said to me the other day, they said, this is a great seminar, very well done, you know, well, apart from the fact that I didn't organize it, Marcus did, I said, I can't take any well dones on this yet because this isn't what we're achieving. This isn't what we set out to achieve. Now you set out to achieve something and the well done comes when you've actually achieved it. Actually working hard towards something is meaningless if you don't actually achieve it. It's all a waste of time. So this is not the purpose that we're achieving, striving to achieve, not just a seminar. And the institute isn't the purpose either. That's just a step along the way. And I'll tell you what, beyond that, even the establishment of a, an unadulterated gold standard is still not the complete purpose. Because civilizations rise and fall, paper money rears its ugly head again, the whole thing collapses and then gradually gold comes back and a new civilization is created. And thus it has been the real cycles of history. It's the rise and fall of gold and silver. <coughs> and uh, those wonderful times where you look back on those splendid Particularly in Europe, those lovely, lovely, beautiful cities with their gorgeous architecture and beautiful music and wonderful literature, they're the times of gold. And then the paper money comes in and it all collapses and starts up again. It's important that beyond the establishment of the Gold Standard Institute that we continue going, that the, the Institute is forever. And it's got to stay there and it's got to be continually educating. I want to see a future, maybe I won't live to see it, but in the future I want to see money being taught in schools. What money is as a primary, a primary level of education going right the way through. And that's our product, a world which totally understands the gold standard, so there is no possibility of ever returning to paper coupons. Because that's really silly, you know? and it's really a degraded state of existence. It's not just a degraded money, it leads to a degraded state of existence. I don't want that. So we've got a long job to do, and at the end we'll take a well done. But at the moment, it's all a bit premature, you know. But we're working, we're getting there, and there are lots of fantastic people coming on board. Now, I'm going to cover something here which isn't down on here, but which I thought about last night, lying in bed, trying to sleep, which I failed to do. <laughs> and uh, I'm not a man to die wondering, you know. It's just not my style. In fact, I'm an incredibly impatient person. 
And I'll go even further than what I just said. I'm not prepared to go to bed tonight wondering, so I'm going to ask a question at the moment. But right now, right here and now, I want to know who in this room is prepared to raise their hand to donate or to pledge 250,000 euros for the establishment of the Institute? It's a very good question, okay? But as I say, I'm not about to go to bed tonight dying wondering. Is there anybody in this room who would care to support this and to actually see this establishment? Once we're going, we can actually be viable. We have a very, very good product. It's a very saleable product. And uh, along with the annuity that Sandy is organizing, we can do it. But I need some money to set this institute up. And I need a good looking building in Vienna. I can set things up on a shoestring. It's been my speciality throughout life. I've set up many businesses. And I've usually done it on a budget which was somewhat less than I want, wanted. But I would ask the question again, is there anybody in this room who cares to raise their hand to pledge 250,000 euros for the establishment of the Institute. It's 340 ounces of gold. People can think better with that. Okay, so I'll change that. Thank you. It has to be willing and able, Jack. Is this a present good or a future good? That's the question. Is there anybody who would like to contribute anything substantial towards this at all? Thank you very much. What's the would you care to name it or would you rather discuss it privately? Phil? What about 25? That would be just a fantastic start. Really, really fantastic and I really appreciate it. Is there anybody else? Willing and able. Okay. Later on, as you sort of hopefully come to the website, read more about this, read the introductions, read the purpose, really come to an understanding of what it is we're trying to achieve and the fact that we can achieve it. Don't doubt that. This is not something hard we're doing, you know. It just needs to be done. This is not some incredibly hard thing that will never happen in a million years. It's not like that. This is actually quite simple. We've got a moment in history here, a moment in history, a little window of opportunity where we're actually poised on the verge of an enormous change, an enormous change. And it's always very hard to conceive if you actually get there how big the change is going to be, but it is going to be big. And at that time, there is a time in all histories where change is possible. When the Soviet Union collapsed, I was talking about this to someone this afternoon. When the Soviet, it was Richard, he's gone now, unfortunately. When the Soviet Union collapsed, they had this system, and that's all anyone knew. And the system, and obviously the system was right, because we, well, most people go through lives never questioning their own paradigm. They look at previous ages and they can see the silliness there. They can see the witch doctors are crazy. You know? <laughs> they believe the world was flat. But they can't so inspect their own time. And so they put up the things and imagine that whatever is now will go on forever. This will not go on forever. We are heading to a threshold, we are heading to a moment of change. And it's really important that we're there, armed with this knowledge, and knowing that we have the ability and the people to effectively implement it. So that's all I have to say. But if any, any of you think about this and uh, decide you would like to contribute, as well as the two wonderful gentlemen here, please do contact me. I'm very contactable. <laughs> Yes. Ah, I just want to say something. Come up here, Brian. Yeah, no. I also want to say that we have DVDs from this seminar. I've just been informed. Look, there are the hundreds of hours of editing to go into it first, but in a couple of months' time, the DVDs of this seminar will be available, and they'll be available from Professor Antoni Paquete's site, and also there'll be a link from the Gold Standard Institute. I'm not sure where that one is. So either way. And Ron has a little announcement to make. Philip, sorry, yes. is last year's seminar available? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's on there. Yeah. Okay. Um, some of you may have met Graham, who was here on um, Sunday, and Bully Mark, which is a distributor of Perthnet, was supposed to be here, but he couldn't make it. And one of his little
promotional things was um, he'd acquired some, which I hold in my hands, is $5,000 trillion. <laughs> and he has got his little sticker on the back, it was a little promotion thing. And I said to Graham, you know, you shouldn't, shouldn't leave. Um, I think it's a great pity if you don't... Um, uh, I don't get... So I asked him to send these to me, so I'm going to hand these out. Um, and so everyone can get what he was going to do, which was everyone can get a, a hundred trillion dollars, these notes. Wow. <laughs> wow. What I'm trying to do here is get the... Don't add to the Institute. <laughs> We should put these on the wall. He has to do makes the U.S. dollars. Yeah. The bucks don't here. Right now, the other thing is that the Professor said about things going to hyperinflation. Um, he acquired these on bulk, so they do have a value. And I think those are sort of the approximate. So one of these notes is worth about seventy cents. I think is what he had to pay for. And therefore, if you look at the Australian gold price. Um, you can then pull the right the cross plane. <laughs> 170 quadrillion. <laughs> so we've got our, and so you're going to sort of get those zeros and. So you're going to the EO for them. I think it's, it's 170. 170,000 trillion. So there is a price, you can, there is a price for gold in Zimbabwe dollars. Thank you. I just remembered something, by the way. The other thing was, another thing that went through my head last night was just this old thought, but I thought I'd pass it on to you. Um, I, I remember for some reason the saying, I don't know why I remembered it, but it was the price of, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And I thought, oh, right, okay, well, the price of liberty, prosperity, and peace is eternal gold. <laughs> on that note, I'd actually like to hand over to... Um, the centerpiece of our seminar, the intellectual inspiration for, I think, every speaker up here over the last few days, and uh, a wonderful man who inspires not only us here, but thousands and thousands of people from all the corners of the globe. And um, I don't need to say anything more about him because he is known to be well after four days of listening to him. He's a wonderful man, a humanitarian, a monetary scientist. In fact, the heavyweight monetary champion of the world, <laughs> Professor Anthony. Thank you very much, Philip. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this seminar. I hope you have a pleasant memory. You will have had pleasant memories of it. I am giving you a parting thought which has to do with the essence of our Western civilization. We have always prided ourselves in uh, scientific culture, scientific civilization. Our science is based on solid knowledge and there has been a tremendous improvement during the past couple hundred years in this. The American Econometric Society has a motto which is attributed to Lord Kelvin, the British scientist who is best known of the uh, absolute zero temperature measurement. Measuring temperature, he was the one who calculated the absolute zero temperature which cannot be uh, approximated in practice, so it's a theoretical concept, but there is no colder temperature than the absolute zero. So that's Lord Kelvin, and I think he is 
uh, his scale of temperature is named after him, so that's how it's known. So the saying uh, and the motto of the Econometric Society is, uh, and that's not verbatim because I uh, just recited from memory. This is what it says, if you can measure something, you can know about something. If you cannot measure, then you cannot know, you cannot do science. So measurement, he put at the foundation of scientific knowledge. And indeed our scientific culture has taken great pride in improving measurement constantly. It became a passion, it became a fascination to uh, keep improving the ways and methods of measurement. Let me just take uh, three examples. Uh, in physics, they use the CG, CGS system. C stands for centimeter, G stands for gram, and S stands for second. So it's measuring length, measuring mass, and measuring time. These are the three pillars on which the uh, measuring system of physics is built on. Well, length, measuring length, has a fascinating story. It started with a unit which was called the foot. And the foot was defined as the length of the monarch's foot. So everybody had to use that as the measurement. Those who made ropes, those who sold clothes, and <coughs> if the king died, then the measurement had to change its, the measuring had to change its unit. The new king had a different length of foot, and everybody was hoping that it was shorter than the <laughs> <laughs> Because then, of course, the rope makers could continue charging the same. <laughs> For a larger number of <laughs> feet of rope or clothes or whatever the thing may be. And if the king happened to have a longer foot, then it was politely suggested to him that perhaps he should have his toes amputated. <laughs> Now, that didn't go very far, and in fact, uh, scientific uh, culture developed to be, after some bloody revolutions and wars, uh, the French Revolution brought the first real uh, scientific measure of length, and it was the meter. And the meter was defined as, uh, as um, uh, a, a platinum rod where two marks were carved into the rod and uh, there was a, a copy of that which was placed in a, an institute in France, in the city of Sèvres, where there were other, also other scientific measurements. and. So if anybody had to authenticate the length of a meter, then it would have to conform to this platinum rod. Now why was it a platinum rod? It's not because platinum is a precious metal, not at all. The reason was because the platinum uh, as a metal had the property that it was least uh, sensitive to change in length as a uh, function of temperature. Well, as you all know, uh, the length of anything could be a pencil, could be a metal rod, 
or whatever would change the length in response to change in temperature even so uh, small a change but scientifically it can be shown that as a rule higher temperature causes the length to increase lower temperature causes the length to contract so they surveyed all the available materials and they came to platinum uh, which uh, appeared the most suitable because it is least responsive to changes so the measurement can be that much more accurate. Well for a long time this served and of course uh, most of the western countries outside of the English speaking countries took over that and uh, the time came when even that improvement was insufficient. So they were looking for something which was even more accurate than the length of a platinum rod. And uh, uh, the uh, definition of the meter changed. Changed for the better because even the platinum rod was not perfect. Even that had a certain elasticity which made measurement less accurate. So the uh, new definition of the of the meter was given in terms of the wavelength of a certain monochromatic color which was defined well, I, just to, for the purposes of this popular presentation I will say it's an orange col color but that's of course not a, an accurate uh, not a precise definition but there was a way to relate it to some to the spectrum of some of the stars to define just what orange color it has to be a monochromatic color and we know it's a, uh, it's a, a, a wave and there is a wavelength involved and they define the meter in terms of that wavelength. And uh, that was again a great improvement and uh, a similar story goes for measurement of time. Uh, first there was the, the, uh, the clock but uh, th that was not very accurate and it was also exposed to various uh, influences and then they came to I think the uh, they found that quartz the mineral quartz had a property that it resonates if it's excited under certain uh, electric s stimulus it comes into resonance and, uh, and um, the uh, the, uh, the time is the reciprocal, can be defined as the reciprocal of uh, the frequency of such a, uh, such a wave and uh, the, the time, was time, which is the second in this case, was defined. Now I'm not going to tell you about the, way the mass, which is uh, uh, which first was defined in terms of the mass of water, certain, uh, certain volume of water, uh, which again turned out to be inadequate for more precise scientific purposes, and then they uh, introduced the electronic uh, elementary particles, atomic physics, and so on. You can talk about the mass of the electron, mass of the proton, the neutron, and so on. So the definition was given in those terms. In all these examples, the common earmark is that you've got to increase accuracy. In other words, starting with a more or less elastic 
a measuring rod. It was discarded very soon and then going to more and more precise definitions. With one conspicuous exception, when it comes to defining value and money, you notice the opposite movement. Elasticity. So rather than going from the less accurate to the more accurate, we are going from the more accurate to the less accurate. And this is a, a very strange phenomenon in a society uh, as the Western society <coughs> priding itself of uh, constant improvement in measurement when it comes to money, when it comes to measuring value, the world shows a very strange preference for less and less accuracy. So in effect, the unit of value, measuring value, is the US dollar, which is like measuring length with an elastic tape rather than a platinum rod with two marks marking off the length. So just imagine what would happen if the same principle was applied in physics, or in chemistry, or in therapeutics, or any other human endeavor. Economics has to be different. There we prefer an elastic measuring rod, which can be fiddled which can be manipulated and this is even worse than the foot of the king used as the <laughs> unit of measure because at least the unit of king was the same as long as the king lived but the value of the dollar can be manipulated and is being manipulated and of course we had history shows lots lots and lots of experiments which came to a very sad end. Uh, and they all tried to do the same thing using irredeemable currency as a unit of value, as measuring uh, value. So this is an aberration in, in the history of Western civilization. And I can only say that if this experiment is not going to fare any better than the previous experiments. And there is no logical explanation how this uh, mindset could come about, that whole branches of science, such as economic, uh, economics, econometrics, uh, the uh, science of bookkeeping uh, and, uh, could make peace with this approach. There is just no rational explanation for that. Well, of course, we can always assume that it's the government and the banks and the conspiracy of the two which is behind this. But even that is not uh, satisfactory because in the history of the church, for instance, there were these great uh, uh, movements such as the Reformation, uh, which uh, set right certain dogmas which were unacceptable to the people, and, um, and the Reformation was a manifestation of this dissatisfaction, and it created a tremendous change which uh, had not only religious connotations, but a lot of others, for example, just mentioned that the Reformation is credited with uh, the legalization of interest. Before that, uh, interest, all kinds of taking and paying interest was considered as usury, and this was punished by uh, civil law as well as canon law, church law. And it took the Reformation, uh, this was a side effect, this was not the main message of the uh, religious movement which uh, was initiated by Luther and Calvin and others, but this was a very important side effect 
that that uh, this uh, uh, anti-usury movement was eliminated, and uh, it took a couple hundred years b before the Roman Church, the Catholic Church, uh, consented that really interest, if it's within uh, reason and it's not uh, uh, punitive and it's not uh, against the poor is going to be uh, legitimized and this is what happened. So we have that problem in our culture and let me just say that the connection between gold and measuring value is very close because gold, just like platinum, has the, the smallest coefficient of expansion. In other words, it's the least <coughs> elastic material in response to changes in temperature. The same way gold is the, the least exposed to uh, changes as a unit of value. And that is really the reason uh, why gold became money. It was not um, the decision of a king or majority vote of a parliament or any other, uh, but it was the uh, human, collective human experience which lasted for thousands of years, which ultimately promoted gold to that position, that it had, the technical expression is, had, had the uh, constant marginal utility, or you can say marginal utility which declines at the slowest possible rate among all the commodities. That is the property which promoted gold, and that is why gold is the ideal measure of value. And that's one reason why I am uh, not a great follower of the gold price. Now, of course, I, I know what is happening and what will happen, but I try to de-emphasize this because I think the whole concept is upside down. It's not the gold price that is changing. It is the price of paper currency in terms of gold which is changing reciprocally. It's an inverse relation. So as the paper money depreciates, the gold price goes up. But this is an optical illusion because people have a, uh, a feeling that now we are richer because the gold price went up $100. But actually, if you consider that this is just a reflection of the elastic measurement of value, which is paper money, then uh, uh, you m must be humble enough to admit that this is not such a great cause for celebration. Now, of course, uh, you are right because uh, you have tried to ensure your wealth in terms of gold, so this is a uh, reward, the higher gold price gives you an acknowledgement that you had the right idea when you were uh, using gold as a protection against manipulation of value of paper money. But basically, uh, the problem is still there, that the monetary system is being debased, and it's debased deliberately, and it's going to end in a, a, a catastrophe which will uh, impoverish the world. There will be a lot of economic pain and suffering and even civil wars and uh, breakdown in law and order. So it's not a pretty picture what we are going to see and there is not enough intelligence or uh, enlightened thinking in our society to realize that we are just running into this great great catastrophe and the scientific community cannot muster enough courage with the exception of the Chinese uh, to say that 
we have to stop that experiment. We have tried and we see that it doesn't work. And this is time to acknowledge that. We just had not got the uh, moral courage as a community of uh, uh, enlightened citizens, scientists, uh, professionals, and so on, to bring ourselves that we have to say, no, enough is enough. That, it, that experiment has to be phased out. This is, this is one of the great mysteries of our present age in the 21st century, that in spite of all these failures and all the miserable record of paper money, in, uh, starting in China actually, but coming to the West as we took over paper and other technology <laughs> from uh, the, the oldest civilization, which is Chinese, I guess, is it Sanskrit? Uh, let's not go into this. The fact is that uh, it's a blot on Western civilization. It's a shame. It's actually, I am ashamed to admit that I belong to the Western civilization because it's running into its destruction. And there is nobody, uh, at least not an organized movement, maybe ours will be like that. But it's very late in the day, and 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 the catastrophe is is getting closer and closer. And ours is like a runaway train from which the brakes, which was gold, have been removed and thrown out, discarded, and now the train is running downhill, and there will be curves, and the catastrophe is seems to be unavoidable. So going back to my starting point, our scientific culture, which we were so proud, has this block and we are trying to do something about it. We are trying to uh, do a scientific study of uh, such things as the gold market, which is extremely important and I have had occasion to write about it and talk about it, that the uh, capital of society without which there is no production, there is no prosperity, there is no uh, welfare, is being eroded and ultimately it will be destroyed with the exception of the gold component. So if companies are there, which in secret carry a separate account, uh, a capital account, which is in gold, and I'm suggesting to you there are such companies, they just don't advertise because they, <laughs> they would, would not want to invite the attention of the tax authorities or the uh, scorn of the economist profession or for whatever reason they keep a low profile, but there are some companies which set up a gold account in their capital accounting, and that gold account is safe because that can not be destroyed no matter what happens out there. But th that would be the exception. The, most of the companies and most of the individuals, because this also applies to individuals, do not carry a gold account. Not e even, uh, 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 you know, a, a mental accounting to keep track of the depreciation of, of the, or the basement of the monetary system. So that is the role of gold. Gold is a unit of measurement, namely measuring value, measuring money, uh, and. Uh, and that is its role, and no amount of government propaganda and no amount of manipulation from the banking system will ever change that. It's just a problem of human perception, and it's a tremendous challenge for, for those of us who devoted our, uh, ourselves to uh, uh, educating the general public about the uh, fact 
the theory and history of money and the theory of history of gold. So this is my parting thought to you. Think of gold as a unit of measurement and that would complete our scientific culture. Without this, our scientific culture is just limping along and it's a blot. It's a shame that we do not have the courage to extend our tremendous achievements in the rest of uh, scientific thought to improve and make measurement more perfect in money when it comes to measuring value it's just the opposite. So thank you very much for your attention and I wish you the best of luck for survival because now it, from now on it will be a question of do we, are we going to survive this uh, tremendous uh, um, catastrophe which is waiting for the world to strike. Professor, I, on behalf, I know on all of us, we are in your debt, which is offset by being in your presence. <laughs> and uh, I, again, I am stunned at what I've learned in this past week, and I want to thank you for it.